board. So I wouldn't forget. <laughs> okay. So uh, let us get started. Uh, Okay. So let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we invite you and your Holy Spirit to be with us tonight. Guide our conversation to be with us, inspire us through your word. And uh, we can all pray the prayer together from the inside cover. But the words of our mouth and the, and the meditations of our hearts. Be acceptable before you, Lord, our rock our and, and our redeemer. redeemer. <clears throat> Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Um, I guess uh, there's, uh, my, can get right into it. If uh, I guess we'll go with Kristen, since she was first to volunteer with the first reading. Okay. <laughs> The Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Taking some of the spirit that was on Moses, the Lord bestowed it upon the 70 elders. And as the spirit came to rest on them, they prophesied. Now two men, one named Eldad and the other Medad, were not in the gathering, but had left, been left in the camp. They too had been on the list, but had not gone out to the tent Yet the spirit came to rest on them also, and they prophesied throughout in the camp. So when a young man quickly told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, Joshua, son of Nun, who from his youth had been Moses's aide, said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses answered him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the people of the Lord were prophets. Would that the Lord might bestow his spirit on them all. Okay, if there's a, a word or phrase that stood out and you want to share. As the spirit came to rest on them, they prophesied. Bestow his spirit. Bestowed. Would that all the people of the Lord were prophets. We hear it again. Yes. The Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Taking some of the spirit that was on Moses, the Lord bestowed it on the 70 elders. And as the spirit came to rest on them, they prophesied. Now two men, one named Eldad and the other Medad, were not in the gathering, but had been left in the camp. They too had been on the list, but had not gone out to the tent. Yet the spirit came to rest on them also and they prophesied in the camp. So when a young man quickly told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, Joshua, son of Nun, who from his youth had been Moses's aide, said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses answered him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the people of the Lord were prophets? Would that the Lord might bestow his spirit on them all. Okay. 
any other insights or words or something that struck you from this passage? Well, it does uh, hit home as far as how in our own lives that uh, the jealousy jumps out that we, we tend to do that. We, we like the idea of people being involved, but then if somebody comes forward, it's very easy to kind of think, oh, I, I already knew that, or I, uh, why are they involved? When really and truly we're trying to reach out to everybody. But it does, it, you know, I see it happening a lot in my life, at least occasionally. It's kind of an exclusivity. Yeah, I was uh, trying to think uh, of how to phrase it. <laughs> right, fra kind of a frame of mind. It's like, love the Lord, but love him my way. Right. I hear a lot of what we've been talked about many times, the childlike nature that we are. The na 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 na, he did it. You can't do that, and yet God's saying, "Come on, you know, like we do to our own kids. You know, really, this is not the point. Let's let's move on." Mm -hmm. That's the tone that really struck me um, in this reading. Though I can kind of identify with uh, with Joshua in the sense that uh, I, I guess. With certain uh, maybe events, uh, you, there's that tendency like, oh, well, they weren't there, so they don't know. Uh, like uh, Audra said, the exclusivity, like they, they're not in the know, so should we share with them? <clears throat> um, they don't need an opinion because they weren't there. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which I know like, uh, I, I uh, you know, I regret having those types of feelings and those situations, but, uh, you know. No, we, we've all parents. done it. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's human nature was what it is. <laughs> Not intentionally either. <laughs> 70 elders, does that play any part in this the number 70 elders. Um, I know that um, most of the, anytime numbers are mentioned, there's a significance to it. Um, I think this is in reference to, there was a point when Moses was, uh, uh, had a lot on his plate, so to speak, I guess you could say. And then uh, his father-in-law said, why don't you delegate and, uh, you know, choose among the, the, the people, the men, some people that you can help delegate. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that's who this group of people, where they come from. And, and that's kind of what I was reading in the, in the commentary in the back, about, um, that these people also, uh, they share judicial authority and responsibility for other matters pertaining to community life. So, mm hmm I just wonder where the 70 came in, the number itself. Because <clears throat> like you said, the numbers have always played such a part in the Bible. Well, didn't uh, Peter ask the Lord how many times you should forgive someone? And he said... 70 times 70, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Huh, interesting. <laughs> No one has thoughts tonight. <laughs> well, Gerald said taking some of the spirit that was on Moses, which is kind of a funny way of saying something that we believe to be infinite, right? It makes it seem like there's some limited supply of spirit. And so he takes some of it that was on Moses. Hmm. Okay. Gerald, is that what you were thinking? 
but with the Lord, that's never limited. It's never limited. Yeah, it's maybe it's just the words. Amount. Seven is a good number. Somebody put in the thing, seven is a good number and six is bad. <laughs> Which is not a bad thought, but it's just different. Thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah. And then also, Ray also mentioned the uh, from the prophet Joel about uh, installing uh, the law of the Lord inscribed on the. I think this is a common, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Ray, this might be a combination of Jeremiah and Joel, or maybe Jeremiah or Joel's referring back to Jeremiah about the law on our hearts. And pouring out his spirit upon all the people. Um, yes, I, I pull scripture from all the books. Uh, I should probably put down the book, chapter, and verse, but I'm lazy. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus does it. He says, it had, you have heard, but he doesn't tell you where it is. Right. <laughs> Company. Uh, well, believe me, I'm I'm struggling to remember where everything's at. <laughs> Don't remember anything. Well, he made but us. He, he made us want to think. So, go look it up. Go find out where it is. What, <laughs> what, what's the thought behind it? There you go. <laughs> He's done a good job. <laughs> Uh, Justine went and looked it up, didn't, or she added in the chat about <laughs> 70 has a sacred meaning in the Bible that's made up of the factors of two perfect numbers, seven representing perfection and 10 representing completeness and God's law. Huh. Thank you. What's one Thank five you. one six reduced? Wasn't that the wedding of Cain and six jugs of water? 12. Oh, it was 12. Was it 12? Six. I thought it was 12. So at the at the wedding feast of Cana, I believe it is six six stone jars. Right. Oh, okay. Maybe I like wine better. So <laughs> I, the, and, and so the number grows in the telling. So well, a nice number. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Uh, uh, but I, I think you Know, the especially when we did the ponder readings when, when the readings were about I will inscribe my law in their hearts and I'll pour out my spirit and you know one of the themes that had come up that time was about missing the point mm. about being focused on some earthly thing or some limiting thing and and missing the point um, uh, and I think this is bringing bringing it up again where it's yeah. like you're missing the point if God would gift his spirit to everybody. Which I, I think how wonderful it would be. Yeah, which I think Joshua is missing the point. Uh, um, he has, and of course, you know, J uh, Moses points out, you know, are you jealous because of me? That like, like it's some offense to me. I guess it's uh, kind of, you know, uh, Joshua is offended for Moses in this instance. Uh, that this is happening but but I'm assuming or I guess maybe I shouldn't assume but I'm I'm thinking that these two who were not present are still one of the 70 I would say so yeah they, they, were, on, they, were, they were supposed to be there they just I guess maybe they had other things to do well either that or they were required to stay back to stay with the camp grouping <laughs> <clears throat> so there would be somebody of authority in place well yeah if they had if they had that authority then yeah that makes sense too that makes sense so. there's a there's a the last line in the commentary uh struck me as well when i was preparing tonight it uh it's just god's dynamic presence to move as it will um Justine can probably tell you or can't count the number of times when uh, I always say, you know, the spirit's going to do what it wants to do, you know, or, or don't stifle the spirit. <laughs> she's telling me that I, 
you know, she's getting after me about something. And, uh, um, <laughs> but, but the, the spirit of the Lord is going to, we, we can't, we can't prevent it. We can't block it. Oh, well, I guess we can, if we're not open to it, but, <clears throat> and I think that's maybe the lesson here is to allow the spirit to work, <clears throat> to allow the spirit to work as it, as it, as God intends it, not as, not as we intend it. We can't put a harness on it and, and move it in the direction that we feel it's going to move how it, he's going to move the way he does. So uh, mm -hmm. that was just what, what struck me in that, <clears throat> in that reading. Yeah. And I think uh, it's a good point, Bert. I think uh, there's always a teachable moment in the things that happen to us um, when we're connected to the Holy spirit. And so all of these folks were complaining and Moses was asking for the burden to be lightened. And so that's one point. So the Holy Spirit provided for all of them, even the ones that weren't present. And then secondly, because Joshua actually took over the watch, if you will, for Moses, it was a teachable moment for Joshua because, you know, he called these other folks out as he, he was jealous of them receiving um, perhaps that was a teachable moment to prepare him for his new position. Good point. Okay. Shall we move on to the second reading? I love that reading. <laughs> Who, I guess, uh, B? Okay. The from James, the chapter five. Come now, you rich, weep and wail over your impending miseries. Your wealth has rotted away. Your clothes have become moth-eaten. Your gold and silver has corroded. And that corrosion will be a testimony against you. It will devour your flesh like a fire. You have stored up treasures for the last days. Behold, the wages you withheld from the workers who harvested your fields are crying aloud, and cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and pleasure. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the righteous one. He offers you no resistance. Any words or phrases that um, you'd like to share? You have murdered the righteous one. He offers you no resistance. Yeah, no, no resistance. And no resistance is echoed in the chat. <clears throat> the word you occurs um, eight times in this passage. Which word was that? You. Oh. The word you occurs eight times in this passage. Finger pointing. Yeah. And it points at me. Yeah, all of us. <laughs> for me, for sure. Um, cries have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts.
Oh, we hear it again? Hey. Come now, you rich. Weep and wail over your impending miseries. Your wealth has rotted away. Your clothes have become moth-eaten. Your gold and silver has corroded. And that corrosion will be a testimony against you. It will devour your flesh like a fire. You have stored up treasures for the last days. Behold, the wages you withheld from the workers who harvested your field are crying aloud. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and pleasure. You have fattened your hearts for the day of the slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the righteous one. He offers you no resistance. This, this idea of no resistance, what keeps coming up in my mind, like what I envision is it was there all the time. It was there for your taking. You could have turned away at any time. There's no entry fee. You know, um, God offers us grace and love, acceptance and forgiveness at any time. And you turned away every time. Yeah, it's like he's saying that all this stuff that you've been doing on earth hasn't been worth anything at all. You've been saving in the wrong bank. Yeah, yeah. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Yeah. In my simple way of decoding this, it's, uh, it's not so much the riches, if you will, of these people it's the fact that they withheld just payment from those who deserve payment correct it's, i saw that too yeah and i think um yeah it's it's not the actual the the wealth that it's the it's what we do with it or it's how we how we see it uh, you know is it the, do we become greedy or is it because i think that's when uh, you know being uh the word detachment uh comes to mind detachment of our earthly possessions you know that it's all a gift from god that so you know in a sense it's not really ours we're we're just kind of stewards of it and to be detached of it of money uh of whatever it is that, that you know, we consider wealth, uh, but when we're too attached to it, that's when, you know, greed, uh, also the worry of losing it. Um, that's, that's where w people go astray, I guess, is, is the attachment to those things. Because we are directed by God to take care of what we've got at the same time. Uh, to trust like the birds of the sky, to trust that it'll always be there for you. You won't go without. And yet there's people who are starving and they don't see it the, what, that way because they're too hungry. At the same time, there's been many a person who's been starving that are grateful to God and see it from a different perspective. So it's all a matter of uh, how we look at it. I never, I never explain anything well. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm listening. I'm listening. Good. And that's, a, I mean, that's a message that even Jesus, you know, it's, it's not the, it's not, it's the love of money that is, is the root of evil. It's not. It's having, not actually having it. Yeah. yeah. Somebody, just because somebody is, you know, done well for themselves and has, you know, it's money not bad. Make them a bad person. No. It's, no. it's, again, it goes back to that attachment to it and the greed and the, 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 the wanting to hold on to it, you know, at all costs. Cheating others out of it. If you're cheating your workers, just wages. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. 
I was talking to a friend of mine about these televangelists and, and the way they live, you know. And she said, well, there's no sin, sin in being wealthy. And I said, no, but it depends on how you make that money and how you spend it. If you, you make that money off the backs of the poor, that's wrong. <laughs> That's right. A lot of deep thought in there. Pardon? It's a lot of deep thoughts. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think, and I'm trying to remember exactly what you said, B, but about the poor, um, maybe because they're hungry. And I don't remember exactly what you said. Uh, or maybe, was that you? Well, I said that you know, the poor, they're hungry, but they're still grateful. In uh, They may be starving, but they're still grateful to God for what they do have. Right. And that was, yeah, I was going to go back to that point because, um, and, uh, uh, you know, the country of Haiti is always on my mind. And now, you know, it's on the minds of a lot of people because of what's going on with the, the migrants that are, or the refugees that have come to the border. Um I, I've had an opportunity to go to Haiti three times and, and encountering those people who, who don't have literally nothing, you know, they live in what we would consider a shack or, or not even a shack, but the people that I encountered were so grateful and so full of joy and so full of love. Um, and in a, in a sense, I think it, in that regard, I think sometimes they have it better than us because they're, they're not worried about the things that they don't have because they've never had it. Whereas, not. yeah, whereas we, like, I'm worried, like, oh, my phone's broken, so what am I going to do without my phone? Or, you know, how am I going to... Well, we're protective of ourselves and are protective of our homes, lock them up, keep things safe, uh, uh, watch out for your money. Uh, the, the constant, it's the, the stewardship portion is being there. Mm -hmm. But it's not always the right reasons. Sometimes we forget to put God first right. and keep right. that in mind. But you're right. The the people that are really really happy and with nothing, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have to be careful not to idolize material objects. Right. Yeah, a friend of mine said. She was glad that she grew up poor because she really appreciates what she has now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. very true. That's kind of like I always said uh, when I grew up too, it's uh, we were in a household with a, a lot of kids and uh, it was, we didn't realize we were poor because we uh, had what we needed. We lived in the farm, so we had our farm uh, food. We always had food. It may have not been the fancy stuff, but we had food. And we had warm clothing, wasn't maybe necessarily the fanciest, but growing up poor is not a bad thing. And uh, it made me appreciate what I've got to this day. Exactly. Yeah, Ray, Ray sums it up really, uh, really simply in his in the chat. He says, in many cases, the more you have, the more you want, which is so true. Very because true. We get to a point where like, oh, I have this and it's so great. And now I want a little bit more. And then the cycle continues. And then he also adds, be careful who you step on getting your getting money. Because um, I think, yeah, because once we get greedy and protective and we want, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to let go of things, but we also want more of it. We're willing to do what we need to to get more and sometimes mm -hmm. that'll take, lead us down the wrong path now one of the books i was reading i forgot which one it talks about uh those who try to find happiness or be content with material objects they never really find happiness the more they have the more they want and that happiness they saw they actually suffer more than those that have not seeking happiness through obtaining material objects it's kind of like uh, society now has made it so easy for us to order things online. Uh, I have to catch myself because I find myself 
searching through emails and text messages to see when that shipping item is supposed to arrive. And I'm thinking, you know, it's not going to change my life that much. I don't really need it. And so whether it comes today or tomorrow or a week from now is indifferent. It'll come when it comes and then I'll put it to good use. Or sometimes it gets set aside after one use because, oh, I changed my mind. I'm on a different direction. <laughs> oh, my. Will's been reading my journal. <laughs> Convicted. So there's, there's, a, there's an old book about transformation, about yearning and transformation. It's called Hope for the Flowers. Um, it looks like a children's book. But uh, Hope for the Flowers, I remember reading it in the 70s. So it's an old book. But it's about two caterpillars. And when you think of caterpillars, caterpillars do have a transformation. But the journey of these caterpillars getting there is something I just really encourage everyone to read. Um, because it's, it's like, what are, you, what are you willing to do to get there? You think you want something and you go for it. And you feel this strong urge and what are you willing to do to get there and um it's a very tender book it's great it's fine for children it's a it's a very tender book and i find a lot of times that the simplicity of that book really speaks to me wow sounds like an impressive author yeah. i'm still a caterpillar give me give me patience i'll <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> let's uh, let's go ahead and move on to the gospel. This is a good one. So I believe Audra, if um, you can uh, read for us. Sure. At that time, John said to Jesus, "Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name." And we tried to prevent him because he does not follow us. Jesus replied, do not prevent him. There is no one who performs a mighty deed in my name who can at the same time speak ill of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Anyone who gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ. Amen, I say to you will surely not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were put around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than with two hands to go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than with two feet to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into Gehenna. For the worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Do not prevent him. Ray added in the chat the, the little ones um, and giving them a, a, an interesting definition. The folks are working on repentance. Yeah, I agree. Do not prevent them. 
the phrase that stuck out to me is their worm does not die. That's just ugh. the fire is not quenched. <laughs> that's that's scary. I have to agree with you, their worm does not die is definitely a context I would have never thought of. We want to hear it again? Yes. Okay. At that time, John said to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow us. Jesus replied, do not prevent him. There is no one who performs a mighty deed in my name who can at the same time speak ill of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Anyone who gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ, amen I say to you, will surely not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were put around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than with two hands to go into Gehenna into the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than with two feet to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into Gehenna where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. My first reaction, even when we read it the first time, is do not prevent him uh, where someone is performing a mighty deed in my name. Uh, that whole thing where makes me think of all our churches that we have in the world, uh, the Christian churches uh, in particular, but all people who are thinking about God in some format, it's different pathways. It's like different pathways to heaven uh, just because they, they are at least thinking of God, whether they're in our the Baptist, Episcopalian, uh, whatever, even to the point of being Buddha, even any of those, they're still thinking of God in some format. I have to smile because I think uh, the deacon prepared us for this uh, not so friendly Jesus uh, last weekend at the homily. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I noticed this is the second time he introduced uh, a child in the story. Uh, which I was familiar with in this passage, but what I didn't know, reading the notes afterwards, kind of scary, but kind of makes a lot of sense. Um, that second part of the gospel, um, some scholars say it refers to child abuse. Uh, I didn't know that until I just read that. And it's kind of scary. Makes sense now, because if you think of sins of the flesh, um, then you find yourself understanding that a little bit better uh, but that second part of the gospel also i want to say a separate point aside uh, sounds very much like the old testament instead of the new testament all in is what he's saying we got to be all in you can't um 
I mean, I mean, we're, we're sinners. I'm not saying if you sin at all, but um, we got to purge, purge ourselves of that, which is not healthy and not clean. And it might be a harsh purge. Yeah, um, this I have another uh, resource that I use um, to, to, you know, kind of get some insight. And one of the things that it, there's a question here that it, that it says is, is how far are you willing to go for holiness? You know, we're all called to be holy. And then, you know, <clears throat> uh, it also mentions that the remedy for sin is cut and dry. Um, I'm, I'm assuming the pun is intended there. <laughs> <laughs> cut and dry um because the very graphic description that jesus uses in these in this you know this part of the, the passage is illustrates the seriousness of the, of, of this of sinning uh, whatever the sin may be you know the drastic ones of you know uh i liked uh ray's comment about the little ones being folks working on repentance um not just specifically children but but all of us who are struggling and working on it um i guess in a sense can be easily uh manipulated and led astray if you have a charismatic preacher or teacher that can lead astray and, and again i go i think back to you know people who have perverted the gospel message for their own gain, um, things like that. Somebody who's looking for salvation and gets uh, taken in by some, you know, televangelist, I think somebody mentioned, or, or some, some of those kinds of things. Uh, yeah. So. Or even translation of uh, what we just read. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. They're implying for you to correct yourself but some people have taken it literally and they do it for you mm -hmm. because you have sinned. And that again, makes it wrong. Right. It kind of goes back to Joshua being offended for Moses sake when there was no cause for offense. Right. Sometimes it's like, Oh, and then that's the, uh, goes back to the, the beam in my eye versus the splinter in my brother's eye. You know, am I mm -hmm. going to be, and what, what struck me, Again, the last pass, the last sentence or so in the in the um, in the commentary says the best way to prevent others from sinning is to prevent oneself from sinning. Each of our decisions and actions affects the community as a whole, the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that made me think of there was two quotes that I uh, came across over, over this past week, as a matter of fact, um, and one, and I didn't look up the saint because I've never heard of him, but he it says. We all talk about reforming others without ever reforming ourselves. And that's basically summing up that, that last sentence. And then uh, that was from St. Peter of Al Alcantara. I'm not sure. I have to look him up. I've never heard of him before. But And then uh, the salvation of all is dependent on the sanctity of each. And that, mm. that was mm. from uh, Dr. Peter Kreft. Um, again, uh, my my week my my prayer life has been kind of that conviction of where am I at and what, how am I working on my salvation not just for myself but for the benefit of others right um, my holiness will hopefully lead others to holiness uh, hopefully uh, if I'm doing a good job well there is a danger in in thinking that you're so good too so holy you know and Oh, I'm so much better than that person, you know. <laughs> so you need to absolutely right. Um, there's that that uh, there's that distinction uh, of uh, holier than thou versus uh, being humble in holiness. Mm -hmm. well, there, but for the grace of God, go I. <laughs> sure. I think the thing for me that's, you know, standing out is, you know, we are all sinners. We all are, you know, we need to be repentant and all that. But the thing that sticks out to me is those lines in the middle of if you cause someone else to sin. That's where we up the ante. 
you know, we, you know, we all have our free will and all of that. But if you start taking people with you, that's the really thing that, and I think in our everyday lives, I mean, I know everybody, I hope by now everybody's figured out I'm a teacher and, you know, in your, in my classroom, I see the one kid that's, you know, messing around, not paying attention and that's just affecting you. But then when you get the one that's really so disruptive that it takes the rest of the class, that's, those are two totally different things. And I hope, and I know he does, you know, when God looks at what we're doing and, and I'm asking for repentance for what I've done, has what I've done influenced others to go down with me? You know, that's, that's where I'm really kind of seeing that that needs to be more on my heart than just not just affecting me. I don't know if that makes, if that makes sense, but. Yes, it does. Because an example of that, that's blatant in my eyes would be gossip. Uh, you can yeah. cause a lot of damage by taking it somebody else and sending it down that rabbit hole right with you. Yeah. It's not, you're not alone in it. Yeah. I think that's why every time I hear this reading that, that sticks to me is, you know, you're not just affecting yourself. Like everybody right. said, you know. Right. And that, you know, that's pretty much I struggle with a lot as well. There was a, somebody, and I've kind of, it's been my prayer that I, I hope. President Powers, Provost Fendez, deans, members of the faculty, family and friends, and most That, um, you know, God forbid that, that you know, work, with working with the youth specifically, that God forbid that teens come looking for Jesus and only find me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not what I'm, that's not what I want for sure. Um, but that, that is a struggle that, <clears throat> that I'm hope I'm not leading somebody just to me or, or even worse away from God, uh, because of something that I've done. So I've yeah. never thought of it as a teacher from that aspect, but that's an interesting point. That's a big responsibility. And, if, and for all of us too, if you think about it, because we're all called to be the witness to Christ's love. And uh... I think the hardest is within our families. You know, we have such entrenched ways of viewing and, and roles that we end up fitting in. Um, and um, oh, so-and-so is at it again, is just as, is, is, is bad. Um, it's, it's hard sometimes to, when I say fix it, it's sometimes hard to um, be that in your family or your extended family. It's a good point. Yeah, and I think that that's the, you know, a lot of times families are the ones that will will be the ones that call you the, the holier than thou. Oh, you're so holy. Uh, and so uh, the tendency not to share um, and, you know, again, it goes back to that, you know, finding the balance of, of our own personal holiness and trying to lead others to Christ, but not being, um, what's the Pushy. Word? Yeah, pushy or the, where it's just like, it, it becomes unpleasant and, and turns people off. Yeah. I think it's very true. They don't always want to hear things too. Right. We're called to share the gospel, but we're not called to hit people with the face with it. Right. Yeah, I used to tell my, my kids, no matter what you do, good or bad, there's always consequences. And we called it ripples in the stream. So it fans out and touches everybody. It's a good way of thinking of it too because <clears throat> one ripple will affect one person one way another section of the ripple will affect a different person different way exactly I noticed that none of us really covered or dwelt on 
the millstone around our neck, but everybody knew that phrase from childhood almost. We've heard it for a long time, but we all kind of dodged it. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> I think in a sense, we kind of talked about it without being specific about the reference to having millstones around our neck, but in, that's in, true. And the talking of being mindful of where we're leading others, like what Audra was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, by sharing that, she was saying that she does not want to have a millstone around her neck. <laughs> <laughs> Nor would anybody that I can think of. Like, I, I certainly think abortion is common one of these little ones you know it's not quite in the same context but I hadn't thought of it that way but that's a good point thank you Dee. <laughs> you affirm me I guess we ran out of steam there. Well, the last thing I was thinking about was the imagery in that one. If nothing else, the imagery really doesn't, you don't want to go to Ghana. Right, yeah. So, no. Just that in itself is enough to kind of make you go, oh, I better straighten up. Right. And, you know, that I think I mentioned it at the, uh, earlier is that, you know, the fact that Jesus uses this very graphic you know, you can tell that it like he's he's not he's not beating around the bush about it. He's not he's not being nice, right? Because <laughs> Jesus wasn't a nice guy. Uh, uh, well, he's probably right. telling it to the people who are trying to rationalize their True. current way of life to to fit in, True. and he he's having to be blunt. Right, and 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 my mind does keep going back to Deacon Harvey's homily about yeah. the you know. Are, are we, are we, uh, do we present a sugar-coated gospel? Do we, do we sugarcoat Jesus's message? And, and in this passage, he's not sugarcoating a thing. It's like, this is, this is the, 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 the question of how far are you willing to go for holiness? You know, are we willing to maybe not physically cut off those things, but I think of like, uh, maybe relationships that are, that are not healthy, uh, that we stay in out of convenience or that somebody might stay in out of convenience, all of those things that, you know, that we, we, we need to cut out of our lives in order to attain the holiness that we're being called to. <clears throat> and it's, it can be very uncomfortable and inconvenient. Um, but. Yeah, but so is the uncomfort of the, forever not dying and your fire is all going on forever and ever right that's quite a uh extreme picture yeah. i'd like to I'd like to call your attention to the chat that uh the last the last entry by ray bunt uh his grandson informed him that there is that there is no hell Oh, really? And that's exactly what I found out when I was reading all these surveys. The kids are being led that there is no hell. There is no life like that. Everything is all peaches and cream. Everything is fine. Jesus is being there with outstretched arms. And there you have it. Regardless of what you do, regardless of how you live, regardless. Right, and and the message that they and or were given in a sense was, you know, just be nice. You know, don't hurt anybody's feelings, don't offend anybody, don't step on anybody's toes. And and interestingly enough, Deacon, the those surveys that you that you referenced, the the uh, the National Survey on on Youth and Religion, you know, those are right. those those kids are all grown up now. Yep. You know, the 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 08 republishing was them when they were in college right 
So these the, these are the people that are parents. Uh, yeah, exactly. And teaching their children, aren't they? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Unless they've been transformed. And right, which they're, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, there is a remnant. There's always a remnant, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, from, from yeah. back before to, to now, there's always going to be a remnant of, of, of those who, who will hold fast to the message and, and continue. Um, yeah. But, and I keep going back to what Audra pointed <laughs> that, that phrase, their worm does not die. Yeah. Oh, that's not nice. uh, cut off. Every time we say it, it's just that gross. Oh, it's gross. I'm, I'm with you. It's like, no, this is oh. scary. <laughs> I'm convinced. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I promise. I promise. Maggots. Maggots. When I, I guess when I first, like, in hearing it, I thought it was like, because the, the spelling of there isn't like, they're a place like in that place worms don't die no it's like their worm like the worms that are eating me will continually to eat me forever eternally yes. yeah so is that the evil person never dies right perpetual yeah. suffering in, in a sense that's, and that's that's what what hell is because it and it is real right regardless of like, I keep rereading something that keeps appearing in the book that I'm reading. I think I think the deacon read, read this book as well. A Teacher of Strange Things. Um, it keeps saying, um, it relates to what we're talking about now, that the devil is so cunning, Satan is so cunning that he will tempt people to commit sin by uh, relativism, getting you to believe that oh, everybody does it. You're just one of the crowd. <laughs> It's really not that bad. And then as soon as you do it, whatever sin it is you commit, he piles on you that you're so evil. <laughs> what you've done is just the sin you just committed is so heinous that you would have no chance of repenting, no chance of getting back in good faith with God. Um, so he plays both sides of the fiddle there. Um, and it keeps coming up in the book I'm reading. Uh, Jesus, the teacher of strange things that I truly believe the deacon read as well. <laughs> if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Well, I, maybe we should have started with the gospel because now we're all, we, we've no, got, all we're all going and talking and here we are at 7.30 on the dot, so. <laughs> oh, I wanted, I wanted to show my book. Oh, for the flower. Oh, oh that's the there's the there's yellow and stripe are the two caterpillars who are the story and um my husband and i read it when we were dating he read the left side of the page and i read the light right side of the page and it really uh sitting down with somebody and going through it slowly was was a was a good thing it's um and uh, we were in graduate school at the time. And sometimes to get ahead in graduate school, you're, the competition can be stiff. And you can find yourself being consumed and getting lost in, in what you're doing and um, sacrificing everything for some top thing that you're going for. And then you realize the top thing is empty. There, it really wasn't what you were really after. You're really after something. But then you found out what you thought you were putting all your effort into really turned out to be nothing. And what you really needed um, was a leap into faith. And the, so the book just hit us at the right time because that's what this book is about. And it's about taking that leap into faith and going all in. And um, it literally, and that is, I like the caterpillars because you're li literally giving up your life. Hmm. The only one you know for something you don't know is going to happen. You don't That's know. So true. Kristen, can you um, tell me the author of the book? Yes, the author of the book is Trina Paulus. Sorry if it's backwards, and it's by Paulist Press. Okay. 
1972. It's called A Newman Book, Paulus Press from 1972. And um, yeah, I, I would honestly recommend this for young couples. Okay, thank you. So um, as we draw our conversation to a close, let us um, uh, pray for the intentions that we have and that we care to share at this time. For the intentions in our hearts, pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. I have a college freshman, and for all the other college freshmen who are out there facing many of these temptations and fears, pray for all of them that they keep their firm grounding that we sent them off with. Lord, hear our, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. <clears throat> I would like to pray for the uh, people in Del Rio, the ones, the migrants, trying to get a better life for the Border Patrol. Just for, for peace out there. We pray to the Lord. Lord, oh, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Um, I'd like to pray for the repose of the soul of uh, Luz uh, Rosales. And Enrique Duarte, my uh, my aunt and, uh, and one of my uncles who passed away recently, uh, for the continued health of all those who are suffering with illnesses, especially uh, infants that have, you know, are sick uh, with ear infections and flus and non-COVID specific things, COVID things, all of the, everything, Lord, for healing. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Father God, we lift up all these prayer intentions that we have shared together for those intentions in our hearts, for those spoken and unspoken. And we pray them in the, the words that you gave us, our Father. Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven. hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Against us. Then, then lead us not into temptation, temptation, but to deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Can, can uh, you leave us with a blessing? Dear Lord God Almighty, we ask you to be with us this day, to be with our family, with our friends, and for all those that are on our mind and in our heart. We ask you, Lord, to let your face shine upon us and to bless us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you all for a great conversation once again. Uh, we will uh, see you hopefully next week. Have a great week and weekend. Enjoy the cool weather. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night.